This is episode 239 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Academic Publishing with Dr. Stylianos Lefkopoulos. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Stylianos or Stelios Lefkopoulos from Nature Cell Biology on the podcast to talk about his work as an associate editor of the journal. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news. That's coming right up. But first, it's only a couple of months until the 2023 ISCR annual meeting, which is taking place in Boston, Massachusetts, and we can't be more excited. If you're attending the meeting, just like we are, keep an eye out for the Stem Cell Podcast booth on the exhibitor floor, where you can learn how you could be featured on an upcoming episode of the podcast. We'll also be hosting a very special meet and greet event at this meetup hub. See you there. Yeah, something I'm sure we're going to hear a bit about in this year's ISSCR is reprogramming. I know it's an old story for a lot of people. You know, it's been, you know, approaching two decades now since uh, the Oxum, but uh, it's been refined, you know. Uh, You can't sleep on it because it's a critical barrier to clinical industrial application is getting reprogramming done in a way that is efficient uh, and high throughput, consistent, safe. So previously, I mean, we started, we covered this story a while back uh, from Hong Kui Deng's group, who's in Peking University in Beijing, China, where they demonstrated chemical reprogramming of human somatic cells to pluripotent cells. They call these HCIPSCs. Uh, the C, the first C there is chemically uh, induced. And uh, the method that they use targets cell signaling pathways and epigenetic modifiers to control cell fate without genetic manipulation. That's the key factor there. Um, uh, relative to initial methods, uh, which involve permanent or transient expression of transcription factors, you know, the classic oxum, even when you refine it with the sendai and non-integration, all that stuff, small molecules are preferable for many reasons. Uh, they function in a rapid and reversible and duration or dose-dependent manner, um, allowing precise control of cell fate. They're also non-integrative into the genome, easily standardized and manufactured, and cost-effective. However, the previous chemical reprogramming method from Deng Group uh, is limited in that it takes a a long time. There is four stages. First, induction of this epithelial-like cells at stage one then the intermediate plastic cells at stage two, then extra embryonic endoderm-like cells are the so-called XEN, Zen cells at stage three, and then primary human chemically induced pluripotent stem cells, that's a mouthful, with pluripotency in the final stage four. And the protocol requires around 50 days. Uh, And also the stage one and two of that process Uh, has conditions that contain serum-based products, right? So in terms of like industrial clinical application, takes a while, you still have serum factors, undefined factors, so it's not really ideal. Uh, And that's where this paper comes in. Here in a cell stem cell story from Deng's group, they lower the bar even further, making chemical reprogramming more accessible and practical Uh, They did this by screening for small molecule boosters and systematically optimizing conditions, ultimately reducing the time from around 50 days in their initial story to a minimum of 16 days. Uh, And this was very robust uh, and efficient. 17 out of 17 donor samples were effectively reprogrammed. Um, While some may argue that this is an extension of previous work, I I still think that it's a bombshell. Why? Because the difference between two months and two weeks is huge. And the exclusion of serum products smooths away to clinical and or industrial application. And also there's a couple of juicy mechanistic kernels included in there that also I think raised the impact and and rose it to the level of cell stem cell for a kind of follow-up story in terms of optimization. I think they still dug in on mechanism there, which raised the caliber as well in two ways. One, the authors demonstrated with extensive single cell analysis that increased proliferation 
an oxidative phosphorylation in the early primary stage of that chemical-induced reprogramming is a key ma mediator of that increased efi efficiency. But the second and I think more striking observation was uh, the unexpected uh, identification of, of the absence of this third uh, stage, this observation that the pathway to rep reprogramming dispensed with those Zen-like cells, um, extraembryonic endoderm intermediate, instead going directly from those intermediate plastic cells to pluripotency. Uh, and this direct passage defies the consensus understanding of somatic cell plasticity and reprogramming to pluripotency. And I think there's a lot of people scratching their heads now, and there's going to be a lot of studies uh, in, in the near future to unpack this novel mechanism of reprogramming that bypasses the Zen cell. So uh, there's a lot there, but most more than anything, I think this is going to be a highly referenced across the board story, and it's going to be the standard for how we do chemically induced reprogramming for really practical translational applications. Very exciting time to be in the work, Arun, as we've said more and more, it seems like we're really on the cusp here. This is great. And this is 15 years in the making when it comes to making reprogramming much more efficient, chemically defined with small molecules. I think this is a this has been a long-term vision, not only of this group, but of the field in general. I think for academic purposes, this is you know game changing. I agree with you. I think this is revolutionary. It's cheap, it's easy, it's efficient. You're going from two months to two weeks. You can't argue with the numbers there. So I think for the academic side of things, it's phenomenal. My caveats, my concerns come to utilizing this for industrial applications. And part of this has to do with intellectual property. Okay. I know that different groups, different companies that like reprogramming, they like using their own in-house intellectual property own approaches of actually doing the reprogramming, whether it's sendivirus based approaches, whether it's episomal plasma based approaches. That is my reluctance at seeing this being adopted, you know, uh, not reluctance, but that's the reason why I doubt this will be readily adopted immediately across the board, especially for industrial applications, because I think there is a bit of a barrier when it comes to intellectual property and licensing for reprogramming, which has been historically a, a very hot area of, of of intellectual property law and litigation, just from speaking from experience, from what I know around here and just in the field. Uh, so I think from a basic science perspective, phenomenal, but we'll see how readily it gets adopted across the board. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, it should be noted at the end of the story, of course, there's the disclaimer that the group is filing for a patent to protect these methods, as you would expect. But you know what I say to industry? Pay the fees, okay? Just pay <laughs> these people and use their method because it works and it's efficient. And we need a standardized approach, I think, across the board so that we can compare. And perhaps, yes, for industrial or clinical application at the large scale end game, maybe everyone's going to use their own in-house technique. But at least, you know, little guys like us, Arun, we can get after it with a quick and efficient method for reprogramming. And I think the bigger implication here in terms of, you know, scope is if you can do this two week reprogramming to go all the way uh, back to pluripotency from a somatic cell, I think that it, it really, I think it, it opens the door. And I think a lot of people are going to pay a lot more close attention, reinvigorate perhaps their direct reprogramming, which I think there's been a lag in terms of whether or not the directly pro reprogrammed cells are, are are really representative correlate or their physiological counterpart in vivo, et cetera. But I think that now not using transcription factors, uh, lowering the barrier to cell plasticity, maybe there's there's going to be a lot of stories coming out from this or other groups where we can get target cell populations that are highly valuable from a clinical perspe perspective, uh, hematopoietic cells perhaps, or others, mm -hmm. uh, cardiomyocytes by direct reprogramming that can be really viable or even engineered uh, to do special things, which I think is is getting along to a story that you're you're coming into right now. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of exciting approaches out there. I, all I'm saying is lawyers kind of scare me, dude. I'm just saying. But yeah, we're talking about cool technologies, and this is definitely another cool technology that I'm going to talk about in this cell paper. Human T cell generation is restored in CD3 Delta severe combined immune deficiency through adenine base editing. You're speaking of intellectual property and licensing technologies. I mean, 
the work that David Liu is doing, who is pioneering a, a lot of this base editor work, I mean, that's been licensed across the board in so many different companies, startups in Boston. So, hey, I mean, you're absolutely right. If, if a technology is appealing, then people should be able to use it and license it and utilize it. I mean, pay the fee for, for making this happen and making the translational dream a reality. And so this is a, it's a basic science story, but obviously has a ton of translational potential. Um, this is a collaborative effort between Gay Crooks, uh, Don Cohn at UCLA, and of course, David Liu, who has been pioneering base editing over at the Broad Institute over in Boston. So the idea here is there's this CD3 Delta SCID, Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Disorder, which is SCID itself has been the focus of the Don Cohn group for a really long time now. I know CIRM, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine out here in California, really loves to promote the work that Don Cohn has been doing over the years, and they rightfully should. They This is uh, a lot of the editing work that they've done has been a de facto cure for, for SCID, and this has been demonstrated in multiple different forms of SCID. I think this is a specific type of SCID, this CD3 Delta SCID, which is a, a really s- serious version of the disease. I mean, it's, it's serious across the board, but this is particularly devastating. It's caused by mutations in the CD3D gene which encodes an invariant CD3 delta chain of this TCR complex, which actually is necessary for normal bimopoiesis or formation of the, the thymus, right? So this is a, it's a point mutation. It's a relatively simple fix. And this is where base editing comes into play. Base editing is super powerful and has been demonstrated over the last five years to be a much cleaner version of base editing, say, than traditional CRISPR-Cas9, which and I always make this analogy on the show, is basically like taking a shotgun to the genome, blowing it up, and then stitching it back together, okay? Traditional CRISPR-Cas9 through a double-stranded break is really dirty. It causes a lot of off-target effects, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's been talked about ad nauseum, right? In comes base editing, and in particular, adenine base editing, which has really been pioneered by the David Liu group to actually restore the function of... Uh, uh, the CD3D, the, the gene that's being mutated in this disorder, in autologous hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. Okay, so they used a, an mRNA, mRNA delivery strategy to actually encode a laboratory evolved base editor. This is a really cool approach that the David Liu group has done over the years to actually custom evolve these base editors so that they're super efficient. Um, and specific for the gene that you're actually hoping to to edit. They introduced this laboratory-evolved adenine base editor, guide RNA, into the CD3 Delta skid patients' uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, resulting in a 71% correction of the pathogenic mutation. And the other important part of this is that the HSCs differentiated into artificial thymic organoids, then producing actually more mature T cells that had the standard properties that you would expect these T cells to have. So in essence, in vitro correcting the defect. Okay. And the next part of this, and this is a largely preclinical study, is introducing these edited human HSPCs into immunodeficient mice and ultimately showing a 88% 88% reversion of the defect back to the wild type, okay? Um, the After the CD30, CD34 positive cells were actually isolated from mouse bone marrow after 16 weeks, they showed a long-term correction of the phenotype and a long-term repopulation of the HSCs. So it's a preclinical study, but it's a huge deal, I think, because in one, this is a devastating disease that they're hoping to very cleanly correct using this adenine-based editing technologies. And I think a big reason in my mind why this is a cell paper is because of those reasons. You know, you're using multiple cutting-edge technologies and you are definitively showing that you could potentially cure cure this devastating disease using this preclinical model. So inevitably, this is going to be going to clinical trials. Technology is going to be licensed across the board to startups. And I'm sure we're going to see this stuff going into patients pretty soon. Yeah, this is another exciting story. Um, For me, the big takeaway is just how that whole notion of kind of orphan diseases has been blown up. You know, this idea that you need to have enough of a disease disease burden across society for someone to make money. And uh, that's not the case here. I mean, we're talking about a disease that's extremely rare. 
um, and uh, therapy that's super precise and I think provides a template for a lot of these genetic diseases um, and, and treatment thereof. And, and as you said, this is preclinical, but I mean, the next step is to go into patients, right? I mean, here they they used even mobilized hematopoietic stem progenitor cells that were mobilized by GCSF, right? So this, this is a population that isn't even necessarily the gold standard for a hematopoietic cell engineering. I mean, you could get a more potent population of cells that should be more efficient in terms of T-cell differentiation and engraftment in the host. So yeah, I mean, this is a preclinical study where the next step is to cure a patient. Uh, and th we're living in that era with sickle cell and a lot of other other hematological malignancies that are just, you know, falling down like dominoes. Um, it's, you know, I love hematopoiesis and, and this story is right up my alley. So I just am so excited uh, that there's people that are going to be cured of a devastating disease with a relatively straightforward, expensive, though it may be, therapy that uh, they can move on with a, a, a normal life. So amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, that that right there, that word expensive, that's the caveat to to really bring up here. And we were talking about these kind of secondary impacts and secondary things to consider with all these papers. I mean, the science is so sound here that no one's doubting that. But in the first story, of course, we're talking about intellectual property. Here we're talking about cell therapy, which is inevitably very expensive. That's, I think, the the dream here is to bring those costs down so that anybody who wants to be cured, honestly, cured with this particular approach can be. Um, and the other part of this is this is a a monogenic disease, you know, very targeted mutation. So how well can this adenine base editing approach be extended to polygenic disorders? I think that's the next step here. But hey, can't argue with the preclinical data here. Yeah, amazing. And you know what? As I said before about the licensing fees, pay. Pay to cure these people, <laughs> all right? It costs a lot more for them to be living their entire life with that burden. And I'm talking about it costs us all. So Let's just pay already. I mean, easy for me to say who has no money. Um, anyway, this is a story we're going to swerve a little bit to something more developmental. We've been talking about real next stages in the clinic stuff here. We're going back to the basics uh, where we all found our love for this field, right? The, the understanding of what it takes to make a single cell zygote into a walking around human being. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, and, you know... A huge part of that, which has been a black box for so long, is the placenta. You know, the, the successful development of the fetus is totally dependent on the placenta, which is this transient extra embryonic organ at the interface of mother and the fetus. Um, and the placenta arises from trophectoderm, which surrounds the pre-implantation embryoblastis. This is the stuff we all know, but it's really not well understood how the succession of events by which the, those trophoblast cells invade and form the placenta. Um, and that's key. Plus, placentation and a successful pregnancy is critically dependent on the correct degree of trophoblast invasion. Uh, and defects in trophoblast invasion during early pregnancy underlie a lot of common pregnancy disorders, most notably preeclampsia, which is really widespread. And we really have very little understanding of, of the what and the why there. Um, so previous work from a, a large group here, this is a, a paper in, in Nature that was from a group comprising uh, four lead investigators that were spread between uh, University of Cambridge and Heidelberg. And those are Ashley Moffat, uh, Margarita Turco and Rosa Vento Tormo, all from Cambridge, and Oliver Stegel from Heidelberg. Uh, the previous single cell tra transcriptomic analysis from the some amongst this group was done on first trimester maternal fetal interface, and that showed uh, a pretty great view, a comprehensive view of the cell states comprising an environment. But um, the the trophoblast cells that are in the deeper layers of the decidua and myometrium of the uterus, uh, they could only get those in samples of, of hysterectomies, really. And the multinucleated syncytiotrophoblast a layer that's also key, is lost in the traditional single cell RNA sequencing. You know, the, these giant multinucleated cells, they don't really come through. Uh, and these are cells that are essential 
uh, to understand the transcriptomic uh, and other expression uh, uh, epigenomic analysis of these cells is essential to resolve the interactions between the trophoblasts and, and the uterus in early pregnancy. And also, there's these novel in vitro models that have been developed, and we talk about those a lot in terms of synthetic embryos, but really uh, models that are just focused on trophoblast stem cells and even trophoblast organoids. Uh, those models have expanded, but whether or not those really correlate to kind of a physiological grounds truth is unknown, and, and we need that ground truth in order to, to validate these models. So this group between Cambridge and, and Heidelberg, um, they generated spatial transcriptomics. I mean, spatial is everywhere nowadays, and it's only going to get more refined, I think, in the years to come. Um, and they here did a spatial, spatial multiomic single cell atlas of the maternal fetal interface, including the myometrium, which is kind of the... Uh, uh, the frontier, not final frontier, but is an unreached frontier in terms of trophoblast invasion. And they use this map to infer transcription factors that mediate the invasion. Um, and here, I think, is key. They show that the 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 transcriptomic epigenomic analysis there uh, correlates well with the uh, primary trophoblast organoids and stem cells. So it's a real, I think, important validation of those models. Um, and they also, you know, look at the transcriptomic uh, in these late stages of trophoblast invasion, predict cell-cell communication events that contribute to invasion. Um, you know, bottom line, it's a comprehensive analysis of post-implant plantation trophoblast differentiation that I think is going to provide a, a reference and a benchmark for understanding and applying uh, these in vitro models, the trophoblast organoids that for, for me, it's a huge deal because we really don't understand or even have a model to, to analyze uh, implantation, embryo implantation, um, talking about IVF and maybe some kind of dysfunctions that may undermine implantation. So it's an important validation of these trophoblast stem cell models and organoid models. And I think the sky's the limit in how we apply them using this as a reference. Yeah, really powerful reference-based paper, and we've seen a number of these come out over the years, you know, these single-cell transcriptomics, multiomics maps of development and all different types of development. You know, I saw a preprint, I think, out there from Avi Regev's group, which was actually utilizing transcriptomics and spatial transcriptomics in the context of a, a standard H&E stain that anybody can do in pathology and basically deriving transcriptomic data from your run of the mill H and E state. I have no idea how that's going to happen, but that's just an example of how broadly applicable, you know, spatial transcriptomics has become in this field and across biomedical research. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, I mean, obviously this is your wheelhouse. This is kind of what you do. And this is what gets you excited. I'm wondering how useful this particular data set would be towards studying early implantation of, say, these synthetic embryo models, like, you know, the the blastoids that uh, Nicholas Ravron actually developed, I believe actually were, were able to show some sort of implantation in, a, uh, in some sort of system. And I believe in the Nature paper they published not too long ago. So how useful would this data set be in terms of intersecting with those synthetic models of early development? I think very useful. I mean, that's it. That's That's the point of this story, I think, is that we need to have the reference so that we can start to apply these models that we can work with, right? The, getting embryos, much less embryos that are, you know, implanting um, and have that interface with the decidua is, is tough, right? They're scarce. Um, you need a lot of protections and permissions there. In this case, they got placental decidual blocks from P13, P14, and P34. So, I mean, rare to get them. They, they had access. Um, and that's why this is such a, I think, a, a milestone, a benchmark study here. But the, the the real future, I think, here, you know, the question used to be, how early, how early can we get? Can we get a, a fetus that's whatever here? In this case, P13 is the earliest. Get. Now, I think the question is um, how we can use the synthetic embryo models to close the gap. It's not how early we can get, you know, bona fide embryos. It's how late we can push the synthetic and having this as a reference, I think, is going to be key to say we get trophoblast in vitro that's acting like trophoblast in vivo at the same exact stage. And I think that we're really right now on the cusp. We've already reached it where the, these, these trophoblast models can overlap 
with the earliest stages from which we're able to get transcriptomic data. So I think we're there and this story may be the linchpin to really racing forward with that whole field of study. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're alluding to is how far we can push this work down the road. And we've covered papers from Magdalena Zernica Goats over here in California, and also, of course, Jacob Hanna using the, the roller culture. I actually saw a Twitter post not too long ago showing that Jacob Hanna's group is working on a third generation of their roller culture. So we'll see how far they can keep on pushing these things. But you're right. I mean, having these data sets will be extremely informative for evaluating and validating all these early embryo models that are coming out. And that's a good transition to our final paper for today, which is a nature cell bio uh, paper. Uh, of course, shout out to Stelios, who's a, an editor over at Nature Cell Bio. We'll be chatting with him in just a short bit. This is a, another transcriptomic profile paper of early human development, a single cell transcriptomic atlas profiles early organogenesis in human embryos. And I think this goes very nicely with what we just covered. Um, slightly different data set here, but the thing I really liked about this was how they've used their single cell transcriptomic approach across multiple different species and validated the data sets across different vertebrates to see how consistent de development is across different vertebrate species. So as we're talking about the early window of human embryogenesis, it's a huge black box, but we're starting to open up that black box a little bit more. And here they're actually probing the cellular diversity of four to six week old human embryos, when essentially pretty much all the organs are just being laid out. And I think what you alluded to previously was the the importance of the sampling here, getting the, the samples enough tissue to actually do these analysis, which is extremely difficult ethically, obviously. Um, but here they were able to do over 180,000 single cell transcriptomes and generating a comprehensive atlas of over 300 different cellular clusters and 18 different developmental systems annotated with a bunch of ontology markers from existing publications. So I think that's the the important part of this is that these clusters and these data sets were validated based on existing publications. I don't know how they're able to parse all those 157 publications and pull all those markers and add them to this paper. Maybe they use like AI or something. I don't know. AI is taking over. So yeah, they combined that with spatial transcriptomic on embryonic sections, characterizing all the different architectures of these 313 different cell types and different clusters that they identified. And then like I alluded to at the beginning, they did a comparative study, an evolutionary development study, and combining this data set with data from other vertebrates to really shed light on how you know, patterning, axis formation, developmental patterning, differentiation of different organ systems, how this is regulated across species and how temporally, how temporally different different vertebrate species are in terms of their development. It's not as uh, homogenous as you might expect, or maybe maybe that's what you would expect. I don't know. So anyways, this is another really powerful data set studying early organ specification in, in humans specifically, but also a comparative study across the board comparing things to, to other vertebrate species. So uh, these are the kind of studies that are enabled by powerful technologies such as single cell transcriptomics. Yeah, a little Evo Devo. I think they had to push it over the top there by bringing in the uh, the mouse and zebrafish there. But I, it's good basis for comparison given the differences. Um, for me, I, I like I read this right after I read the spatial on the maternal fetal interface there, and I was really impressed with the. I love this spatial, the little tiles, you know, that give the expression and and kind of give you an overlay of stuff you already know, right? Where it's, this is the neural tube, but it's the gene expression and highlights that. So I, I, I like spatial just in terms of the implication of where we're going. I mean, the, some of these uh, kind of computer-based programs have, have been able to increase the resolution and look at overlap between the sampling area areas, because I know at least with the Visium chromium, they're pretty big. I think it's one limitation of the approach is that 50 micron is the capture area, which for many systems, my, the ovary included, that like includes a, a whole group of cells, a whole ovarian follicle, which we'd be interested in. Um, so there is, I think, some more work to be done, but I can't wait. I think that it's going to be a bit of a journey with spatial transcriptomics in terms of resolution. But talking to the rep from uh, Visium, uh, from 10X, and uh, maybe they were... Uh, being a little bit ambitious here, but I, it was quoted to me 
that we're going to approach two microns a resolution. So subcellular resolution, which I can't even imagine the kind of insight that we'll be able to glean with, with a system that's that fine. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to hold my breath. Uh, but even now, with the with the systems for deep analysis, I think that we're increasing our ability to see in between these capture areas and really get some refined insight, in this case, into the black box that is early human development in organogenesis. But it's just the beginning of, I think, a lot of other kind of spatial stuff, specifically spatial in uh, the synthetic type context, right? organoid synthetic embryos once we get the space for those i think there's going to be a lot more uh refinement and experimental intervention to try and create kind of de novo patterns of, of organogenesis that maybe don't even mirror physiological organogenesis within a, a developing embryo so I, I can't wait to see where this goes and i think this is something that we've been waiting for for a long time is a comprehensive analysis uh using spatial transcriptomics um, of of human embryos. So uh, my my hats off to the authors here and specifically to the editors at Nature Cell Biology that had the insight and and awareness to realize the impact of this story. Maybe we'll talk about that in a minute with Stelios. Yeah, shout out to Stelios. We'll chat with him in a, in a little bit. But I think this whole roundup has been a love letter to technology, right? We've covered some amazing, amazing technological advancements on this particular episode, all going all the way back to chemical reprogramming, adding base editing, how this intersecting with different uh, cell-based therapy approaches, coming back to the spatial transcriptomics. Technology is incredible. And just the pace and the evolution of technology and biomedical research over the last 10 years has been just astounding. And one thing that, and I alluded to this in the last paper that we covered, one thing that I don't know if worries me, but interests me is these data sets are just getting so unbelievably cumbersome, massive, right? We have to have servers upon servers to just analyze these data sets, supercomputers to actually run some of these data sets. That in itself is a is a bit of a barrier to entry for some of these technologies and adapting some of these technologies, especially to to labs with the, that don't have as many of these resources. But then, you know, on the other side, the analysis, the actual downstream analysis, it's getting to the point where you might have to use artificial intelligence to actually do some of these cross analyses. I mean, you're talking about integrating over 150 different publications and the data sets of those publications into this existing data set and deriving some new conclusions from that. I don't have that kind of brain power. Maybe, maybe you do, Daylon, but I I do not have that kind of brain power. So maybe we have to rely on our you know AI overlords to to take the next step here. For sure, partner. I mean, my brain is degenerating right before our eyes here. But I, we're gonna have to call Chat GPT. Although I'm I'm a little bit wary of that. If you've seen the Matrix, I, I don't think we want to be giving uh, the AI the the secrets of our incipient development. You know, lest they plug us into a battery or something. But we're getting a little bit away from ourselves here. This was a, a love letter to tech, a love letter to early human embryogenesis. And some of the, the pictures in these stories we talked about were really quite amazing, but perhaps not as amazing as some of the pictures that you guys have out there. And that's my segue to the message from Stem Cell Technologies, where the STEM selfie contest is back. Enter your best cell image by April 20th for a chance to win a STEM selfie prize package, which includes a magnetic puzzle of your image. Visit www.stemcell.com slash stem selfie 2023 to find out more about the contest and, and to enter. And don't forget that voting starts on May 1st. All right, everybody, for today's episode, we have a special guest from Nature Cell Biology, associate editor Stelios Lefkopoulos. Uh, who obtained his PhD in 2021 from the University of Freiburg in Germany, based on work conducted in the laboratory of Irini Trompuki at the Max Planck Institute of Immunobiology and Epigenetics. His work described how innate immune signals are triggered by transposable element transcripts during development to favor the production of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells during his postdoctoral studies with Tristan North at Boston Children's Hospital. Stelios aimed to characterize metabolic pathways modulating hematopoietic stem cell development. 
He joined Nature Cell Biology in December 2021 and is based in the Berlin office. Delios, thank you so much for joining us for today's episode. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, guys. I um, This is um, a great honor for me to be here. You know, I'm a great fan of the podcast, so I'm really excited to be here today. The honor is ours. And we are fans of yours, by the way, because we've, uh, you know, had a little partnership that we're going to come around to. But before we get there... Uh, it's really a pleasure to have your perspective shared here with our listeners. Why don't you start by telling us about your role at Nature Cell Biology, a day in the life, so to speak? Oh, uh, well, um, yeah, like you said, um, I work as a, an associate editor at Nature Cell Biology. Um, my um, area is stem cells, developmental biology, and I also handle um, disease mechanism manuscripts. Um, so. My role there is pretty much the same as the role of you know the rest of the team members. So I handled manuscripts in this particular area from the initial submission, um, peer review, and the process um, during reviewing, and then a revision, and um, till hopefully, and in, in, in some cases, acceptance of the manuscripts. Um, yeah, and and my my daily life is basically interacting with authors, reading manuscripts, um, and learning a lot about exciting science in the field of stem cells and developmental biology. And there's definitely a lot of exciting science these days. We've covered so much of it on this show, and obviously the ISSCR is coming up too, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. I mean, you can bet that our listeners who are mostly academic stem cell biologists are playing, you know, paying pretty close attention to what you're saying in this episode, because, you know, it's still a dream of most academic stem cell biologists to publish a paper in one of the nature portfolio, you know, portfolio journals, especially like nature cell biology, which is such a prominent journal in the field. So I'll kind of ask a broad question on behalf of our listeners who are paying close attention, like I said. So what is your journal looking for in a great manuscript in 2023? I mean, there's definitely no algorithm for getting a paper accepted in a high profile journal like Nature Cell Bio, but are there certain technologies, expertise, or, you know, something like that, that the editors are really excited about right now at NCB? So give us a little bit of advice and provide a little bit of advice to somebody hoping to publish a paper in Nature Cell Bio. Yeah, that's, I guess that's a very common question for an editor. Um, the answer is always a little bit disappointing for some people, maybe, because what we're really looking for is um, excellent quality and exciting science. So uh, these can be a lot of, can mean a lot of different things. It's, uh, it's not about specifically the area or it's not about uh, specifically the technology, um, although there are parts that for sure help. I mean, we do love interdisciplinary studies um, and we we do, you know, you, we stay up to date with with uh, the flow of science, meaning that um, obviously synthetic embryology is something that I'm very interested in because it's something that is thriving right now in the field. Um, um, but in general, what we uh, the journal is going for is um, studies in uh, um, multiple fields of cell biology, multiple subdisciplines of cell biology that are of high, high quality and of interest to the communities. So nothing really special in terms of a piece of advice that I can give so as in what you can do to get published there. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 not surprising. I mean, you say Arun asked there, what's the journal looking for in a great manuscript in 2023? And I imagine it'll be something different in 2024 and 2025. And that's really the story with these highest caliber journals is that they're so, you know, everything is so novel and current. I mean, that's kind of the prerequisite novelty. So I guess that's a moving target. But Arun and I both can can share that we've made it. We got through, maybe it didn't take the form <laughs> of a scientific manuscript, but uh, you put together a great Q&A piece in the journal a little while back called Now is the Greatest Time to Be In It, featuring myself and Arun with a focus on our role as hosts of the podcast. I mean, probably the best Q&A I have ever read in my entire life, Stelios, not even kidding. Um, but <laughs> all joking aside and my biases aside, I think the one thing driving the birth of that particular Q&A um, was the increased range of communication in the world in general and in, in the sciences specifically. Uh, how, how do you think podcasting, social media, you know, the, the era we live in and all the different modes of communication um, how do you think that's influencing the editorial landscape? 
Yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for accepting to do this q and I, I was also very excited about it. It was, it was, it was I, I, I like the idea and I love that you accepted to do it. I think our um, readers were also quite excited about it. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to do this is because I believe that podcasts and, you know, social media, uh, they, they have a lot to say in terms of science today. I mean, it's, it's a way of communicating science. Um, and for sure, we are also part of it. I, I myself am trying to be um, very active uh, on Twitter uh, because I'm trying to connect with scientists and the journals. I think almost all journals have Twitter accounts, you know, tweeting about the papers they're publishing. Um, I, I would not say that, you know, this affects editorial decisions in any way, but it definitely helps with outreach and um, it can help with um collaborations among scientists or projects that can happen either you know among scientists or even uh, the editorial world and the um basic research world um so um i would say it's uh, absolutely uh interactive process um i i just wouldn't say that you know that affects in any way the editorial decisions which are completely independent of what is happening in the social media i mean when you get a manuscript you focus on the manuscript and the findings yeah, totally. And I think that's how it should be. It shouldn't be any sort of Kardashian index, as as we like to call it, right? It should be really just focused on the the science. But it definitely is a brave new world out there. And I think folks of definitely of the younger generations are utilizing social media to the fullest extent. I mean, I've established collaborations because folks have slid into my DMs, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it can be very easy for folks around the world to get in touch with each other now. And we've seen the pandemic really facilitate this you know, rapidly because folks were isolated for so long and then social media and virtual landscape was the only way people could actually communicate for the longest time. And like kind of speaking of the pandemic, it in addition to the social media shifts, it caused a bunch of other shifts too. And there's a huge rise in preprints, right? There's a rise of the preprint servers like BioArchive, a bunch of COVID-related manuscripts were being uploaded during the pandemic. Not all of them had the greatest scientific integrity, for sure, but uh, I think it definitely facilitated the rise of the preprint server. So from the editor's perspective, how has this rise of the preprint server impacted the work that established peer-reviewed journals do? Anybody can really publish a preprint you know, today, tomorrow, anytime these days. So do you find yourself paying close attention to certain preprint articles of interest, kind of gauging them out before they're even submitted to a journal like NCB? So kind of tell us about this new world in academic publishing with the rise of the, the preprint server and kind of how it affects your daily work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we do support preprints in general. Um, and my, my personal opinion is that um, it can be very useful for everyone, if I might say, especially for younger PIs, maybe because you know it, they they sort of rely a lot on 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 you know showing their work and what they've done. Um, and I think it fosters um you know collaborations among scientists or getting feedback from other scientists when you just put your work out there, which for sure helps with um uh you know, that helps the paper fare better during the review process because you already get some feedback. Um, and um, yeah, I think it is important because it, it it helps, you know, it's open access, it's it's accessible to everyone so everyone can see it. And I can tell you that as an editor, I do pay attention to what is um, on, on uh, you know, what is published as a preprint. Um, and yeah, it has happened also that I reached out to people having read a preprint that I got interested in. Yeah, the preprint, you know, one of many things that have shifted in, in recent years um, in terms of science communication. Uh, and I'm sure it's really shifted your role and, and, and brought, highlighted a bunch of things in advance of publication that maybe brought it to your, across your desk that might have come before. But I want to get back to, to, to your science, you know, uh, the science that, that, you, that brought you into this role. Uh, your graduate and postdoctoral work was focused on hematopoietic stem progenitor cells. That's a nice choice, by the way, one of my favorites. Um, but I've always wondered uh, about the, this shift from a, a real specialized scientist to more uh, general expertise. You know, every editor has their own expertise generated over, over many years uh, of intensive study. Um, and of course, 
each editor probably gets papers funneled to them based on that expertise. As you said, you're focused on, you know, developmental biology, stem cells. Um, but in many cases, I'm sure you got to manage a review that's a bit outside your wheelhouse, right? So do you find that you've had to stretch your knowledge, become a kind of jack of all trades, so to speak, scientifically? Uh, and also follow, do you love it when you get to run a review that's about hematopoiesis? Is it like going home? Yeah, definitely. That is definitely true. Um, you know, because I mean, I was an expert in hematopoietic stem cells, but then when I joined the journal, I had to handle every subdiscipline of the stem cell, which is a huge field. And obviously, I was not an expert in all this. So I had to read a lot. I still have to read a lot. I read a lot. <laughs> and, um, you know, we are trying to to do our best in the team. So at Nature Cell Biology, we always try to discuss the manuscripts that we have with one or more editors and the team to make sure that, you know, we, we cover the expertise that is needed from multiple sides. Um, it is a challenge, definitely, to uh, transition from a small part of it to, like, the whole chunk of, <laughs> of the field. But um, I certainly love it. I mean... I, I now have a bigger picture of the stem cell field. I understand other systems more. Um, I mean, it even it, it even happened that I, I read about tissues that I was like, does this tissue have stem cells? I didn't even know that, you know? It, it, was, it was like discovering the whole world of stem cells uh, from scratch. But um, yeah, I certainly love it. It gives me a broader picture of the whole field and it makes me understand how how other systems work and compare to what I knew and broaden my knowledge. I It's just a, a great challenge, especially for the first few months when you really need to adopt to, you know, reading what you need to do to, to read in order to be able to assess the findings of each manuscript when it's completely out of your comfort zone. Uh, but it's it's always an ongoing process, I think. I mean, I am definitely still learning a lot of things. That's refreshing to hear that editors are real people just like the rest of us, you know, and you're <laughs> constantly learning as well. And also refreshing to know that you're so well versed in the science of the stem cell field and are constantly just paying attention to the new discoveries that are coming out uh, in the field. And this is really, you know, kind of the norm for the editorial field. Most editors are scientific, you know, scientists, card carrying scientists, a lot of them are stem cell biologists who have decided to shift away from the lab bench, just like what you did. Um, I mean, you trained as a stem cell biologist at the University of Freiburg and the Max Planck Institute and actually decided during your postdoc at the Boston Children's Hospital to kind of make this shift to publishing. I mean, these days, I think the reality for our generation of scientists is that this non-academic career path is really, it's not considered an alternate career path anymore, you know? So tell us what was it like for you to make that jump away from the lab bench and kind of what advice would you give to somebody who's hoping to follow in your shoes and kind of transition to academic publishing? <sighs> Well, I think the advice is a very simple thing. Just go for what you enjoy the most. I So for me, it was kind of complicated. I think that as, as a scientist, um, we unfortunately, I mean, obviously this is going better now with multiple career evenings and other stuff that institutes are trying to organize for students. But I think we have a lot of different options that we're not aware of. Like, it's amazing how many different things you can do and you have no idea about them because most of what you hear when you're in academia is that you can do basic research. Um, so for me, the editorial option was something that I started considering the middle of my PhD when we first um, published the paper um, in the lab. I was a co-author, but still, you know, I was in the process of reading what the editor said, what the reviewer said, and realizing a little bit what an editor is doing. So I thought about it. But then um, after I, I finished with my PhD, I thought that uh, I would need to have extensive postdoctoral experience in order to be able to apply for such a job. Um, and then um, I, I went to the United States. Um, and, you know, I, I did enjoy, I always enjoyed science. It's just that the part of, you know, working at the bench was not really something I, I, I loved. I mean, it was fun at first, but after some point, it was not what I enjoyed. What I enjoyed, and I realized that by that time that, 
I enjoyed reading manuscripts, discussing manuscripts, finding the weaknesses, the strengths, the importance of the findings. Um, and then um, at that point, there was one editor, probably I should not say the name or I'm not sure. Anyway, there was one editor that was offering um, meetings with authors. Mm -hmm. um, I think I saw that on Twitter coming back again to social media and their power nowadays. Um, and I had a meeting with this editor. So I told them that, you know, I'm considering this, but I just started my postdoc. And they told me, you know, yeah, postdoctoral experience is preferred to be extensive, but sometimes if you are a good fit for what they're looking for, you got nothing to lose, just go for it. And then I saw the ad <laughs> that Nature Cell Biology was looking for a stem cell editor. And I was like, well, it sounds like a good fit. Probably it's not going to work, but it's okay, just apply. And it happened. Um, and after it happened, I had no doubt. Like I didn't have, you know, what some people describe that they get the job, which is like a transition towards something different and they have second thoughts. I didn't have second thoughts at all. I just went for it. I just felt, okay, this is something that I want to do. And I went there and it's like I always say, every day, not all day every day, but I feel happy every day and lucky to be doing this job. So again, my advice would be just go for what makes you happy. And, and obviously the skills are a great part of it. You should have the skills, but it's also what you enjoy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I like that answer just because the whole way through, I mean, you started by talking about how monolithic academia and science has been in the past, right? I mean, it was just, that was the, there was one choice. You were in science, you were mentored, and then you men mentored yourself um, in, a, in a basic science sphere. And then, as you also said there, it's taken, I think, uh, the all the different modes of communication to kind of shake that monolith. Now there's all these different modes of doing science, and I don't think people were really aware of them um, until people started talking about them. And you know, Arun and I, we we are really lucky to be a part of this podcast. You know, just because it emerged in this new media uh, landscape that we're a part of and lucky to be a part of. And you know, a part of that is again just being exposed to the possibility and and hearing diverse voices. And this is my segue to the question here. You were part of uh, this 500 queer scientists project talking about diverse voices in, in science. Uh, this was a, a visibility campaign for LGBTQ plus people and, and their allies working in STEM and STEM supporting jobs. Uh, what motivated your, participa your participation in that project? And, and do you think your identity as a queer gay scientist influences your professional experience nowadays. I mean, in, in the kind of editorial landscape that you're in now, I think a lot of people have talked about the LGBT, LGBTQ plus experience in, in academic science. Is there anything that, that you could speak to about your experience in the editorial world? Well, uh, for starters, I, I am in favor of diversity in every form. So that's part of the reason why I'm part of this project. And um, I always try to support diversity, not only in terms of the LGBTQIA plus community, but um, on every level that I can think of. Um, and it's also policy of the journal to support diversity from you know, geographic diversity to gender diversity and every on every possible level. Um, now, I would say, I mean, I, I still feel that um, we are um, underrepresented um, in the society in general, um, possibly also in science still. Um, and this, you know, being a part of this project and communicating that is a way of having a voice and encouraging um, people who are like young scientists, for example, who are part of the community and feel they need support. I myself have been lucky enough to be in supportive environments. I never had to deal as in my career as a scientist, at least, had to deal with any any racism or, or you know, discrimination or, or any, any, any kind of that thing. But um, uh, I, I know that this is not the case for for everyone. And we we have all heard, even if sometimes we we pretend that we don't hear, we've all heard of cases that um, we're not as lucky as I was. Um, that's why I think this is so, so important. And um, 
actually, I believe that the fact that I have not dealt with any such cases myself is that I, I keep this as a high standard that I, I need to respect the people I work with. So I always go in environments that I know mm. are going to, you know, respect diversity, promote diversity. And uh, probably that's part of the reason why I say I'm lucky and I've never had to deal with any unfortunate situations about um, my sexual identity or, or any such thing. Um, but I think it is important to, um, Regardless of whether you are a part of the community or not, and that's why I said I also support other other um, minorities, if you might call it that way. Um, I think it's important to promote this for multiple reasons because diversity is innovation. Essentially, it can lead to progress, and because I think that as scientists who are educated people, the first role that we have is to be a good example for the rest of the society, and inclusion should be a part of it. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. I think as scientists, we're strongest when we are getting insights from a group of fellow scientists who are as diverse as possible because we want to be able to, you know, pick the brains of people who are different from us. I think that's how science should work. And uh, that's how the most creative thinking should happen. So just your visibility, I think, is, a, is such a positive for not only for being here on the show, but also into the in the field in general. So, you know, lastly, we've got this big old stem cell meeting coming up uh, in a couple months, this ISCR 2023 in Boston. And we actually met last year at ISCR 2022 in San Francisco. It was a, it was a great meeting meet and greet event that we got to be a part of and we can't wait to to be there in person in Boston it's also going to be a virtual meeting too um so what are you looking forward to for ISCR 2023 i'm assuming that you're going to be there and uh you know what are what are you looking forward to from the from the editor's perspective in terms of scoping out the the coolest science that's going to be at the meeting oh you bet that i'm going to be there of course, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to miss this meeting. <laughs> um, well, I am looking forward to um, seeing, again, people I met last year, to meeting new uh, people, also people that I haven't met in person yet. I mean, you know, the pandemic period has made it has made everything weird. So there are people I have interacted with, but I have not actually met because there were also conferences that I had to attend virtually. Um, and I'm looking forward to great science actually and learning more about new projects and, and and interesting stories going on and and you know talking to people who would be interested in in discussing the possibility of coming to nature cell biology um for their stem cell and developmental biology studies um and also you know i think it is after I think the ICCR was the first meeting that I attended last year in person after a long break. It it was a completely different feeling compared to, you know, during after all this time with virtually attending meetings, it, it felt like we were all kind of a family and we were very happy that, that to see each other. And I think it's still the hype is still there. It's still going on. So um uh it's it's like being in a huge party and enjoying the science at the same time. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. I can't wait because I, I would say the San Francisco ISSCR, while it was kind of a, a reunion uh for a lot of scientists, it was it was also very heavily virtually attended. And I feel I don't know what the numbers are, but often I would say maybe 20% less than than what you would typically expect pre pre COVID. So I'm psyched to see that other 20% come back or at least 10, 10 more incrementally more toward 100% attendance. Um, and I, I really think that like last year, where it was this big reunion party atmosphere, I think even more so this year, because we still really long for that contact of, of meeting in person. And it's going to be so great. I can't wait to see you again. And uh, before I uh, let you go here, before we let you go, we're going to ask you a couple of peripher peripheral questions, um, starting with uh, if you were not a scientist or a, a editorial associate editor at NCB, what would you be doing with yourself? Uh, well, I I'm not I'm not going to talk about science related jobs so the problem i always had was i liked many different things i like writing for example um i think i would probably be a lawyer though <laughs> I, I i do have for some reason i do have an interest in this field so i i think i'd probably be a lawyer 
Interesting answer. We've never gotten that one before. I mean, we got interior decorator. We've got <laughs> it all over the map. I, I would have thought you would have said novelist. You have published two novels in Greece, which we, we didn't talk about. If you guys are listening, oh, yeah. interested in that, go check that out. Um, but lawyer. Wow. I, I'll take you as my lawyer. You seem like a, a, a pretty tough case, at least from the editorial standpoint. You got to say no to a lot of people. So you'd be a great <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that, you know, writer would certainly be a possibility, but I think that writing doesn't, well, for me, it wouldn't work as 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 a job. It mostly works as a hobby. Like, I need to have inspiration to want to say something, to write about something. That's why I said probably it was going to be a lawyer, yeah. And I would be a tough lawyer, you bet. <laughs> uh, you're high. Uh, <laughs> finally, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given, either professional or not? Uh, yeah, um, not to be too emotional. That's that's a piece of advice my PhD mentor Irina Trumbuki gave me. Um, it hasn't changed much, but but I'm doing progress, and at least I came to realize that I'm way too emotional about things that I should not be, and that this you know can just sometimes be an obstacle and things that you want to achieve. Yeah, that is good advice, classic good advice, but I've always found that when someone says to me to not be too emotional, it's because I am emotional in that moment, and it seems <laughs> kind of like unfair advice. Like, yeah, sure, but um, great advice, especially in science, and uh, I, I mean, I'm sure you must deal with a, a whole the whole gamut of emotions in, in, in terms of resistance to to whatever the editorial decisions are, so that that's good advice coming from someone who's seen both sides of it. Um, and a great series of insights from you, Stelios. Thank you so much for sharing with us all the all the insights that you have about the editorial world and just your experience as a scientist. Thanks so much again for uh, joining us for this episode. Yeah, I, I gotta tell you, this is one of the most exciting things I've done in my life. Thank you very, very much. I mean, I've been a fan of the podcast and now I'm a part of it. It's a great honor. Thank you. The honor is ours, my friend. All right, everybody, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Until the next episode in a couple of weeks, thank you so much, you guys, for listening.